What is the current evidence and understanding on clinical outcomes related to sinus lifting procedures? For example, in the maxillary posterior region, can we trust short implants as a less invasive alternative to reduce morbidity? Today, Professor Ronald Jung from the University of Zurich brings to the table the evidence, the guidelines, and point of view on both options. Curious? Stay with me on this one. I'm Dr. Christian Jerry, and you're watching Strawman Open Mic. Hi, Ronnie. Hi, Christian. I have to confess that I'm biased because for me, you are one of the most knowledgeable, most curious, and one of the most fun peers in this whole dental community. So I'm really honored to have you in this drum and open mic. Thank you so much. I think there could not be a, a better starting for the uh, open mic. And I'm very honored and happy to be part of that uh, important discussion. I think it it really adds to our community and uh, an important angle of view, which we usually don't have. The topic of today, I think we are a bit far from a consensus between different dental communities, is the, uh, is the use of short implants and why we should trust them in our daily basis. So there are many, many points to be discussed. I hope we can clear some of them. Yes, for me, the, the short implants is something which I look back for more than 10 years, which we have uh, invested a lot clinically and also scientifically. And I have to admit that also my view of the, of the indications uh, and the limitations have changed over these, um, I would say, 15 years. And it's exactly this topic that we're going to discuss today, the use of short implants in our daily practice. And I think never in history so many patients have been spared from the need of a second donor site as of today. We live an amazing moment in biomaterial. So we can uh, just literally out of a box, out of a bottle, already do some kind of magic to, uh, to spare patients from morbidity. On an equal pace, the, the industry has evolved tremendously with better alloys, better connections, better surfaces, enabling the use of short implants predictably, right? Yes. And when we look at it, both, both advancements have this huge social responsibility with the strong patient centricity. How do you see all these technologies coming forward? I think you pointed very nicely. I think for us as, as dentists and as medical doctors, I would, uh, I would say, it's important to look at it from a more comprehensive point of view. And at the end of the day, we should have more treatments available, which more patients can profit from, which are less technique sensitive and which are less invasive to the, to the, to the patient. And from that point of view, the, uh, the short implants have really became an important instrument in order to, uh, to fill that goal and, and to drive further that vision of reducing the invasiveness of, uh, of our treatments we, uh, for our patients. And when it comes to definition, there are many definitions what short implants, there's ultra short and short and semi short. <laughs> what is, let's take ITI as a reference. What is the ITI reference? Where do we stand for short implants? Yes, so the, the definitions, as you said, they have been really multiplied and they have been a part of many different consensus conferences. But today, it's at the end also a common sense. So I would say for us, a short implant is six millimeter or less. Uh, some they consider a seven millimeter or less. But I think that the a common sense is kind of six millimeter or less. That's considered to be a short implant. I've been reflecting on this topic, especially in particular uh, as an alternative to sinus lifting and under three different perspectives. What is the evolution of evidence on short implants? for in comparison to different alternative on sinus lifting. Uh, what are the clinical norms? What do we do today differently from the past? And what should we start doing now from this moment on? And also the ethics of care. And at this moment, I will uh, give more attention to the evolution of evidence. There's the AIO, Consensus Conference Systematic Review, which uh, Professor Hemmler and yourself participated. It was comparing the use of short implants versus grafting the sinus. 
uh, to enable the use of regular implants on that particular comparison. So the findings were quite interesting because it brings similar success rates, which is already outstanding. Mm -hmm. However, there's a plus to it because the short implants bring significant lower risks. Huh? So, uh, and the conclusion is that we make clinical, I mean, not we, but the conclusion of that paper is that the, the clinical recommendation is that in situations like this, then short implants should become the norm of care and not the alternative. Tell us a little bit about those findings. I'm very happy that you addressed this point. And uh, you also looked a little bit at the evolution. And I think that's important when it comes to that point. On the one hand, short implants have in the past only been used where nothing else has any more worked. And so the majority of evidence which is available is based on comparing a standard length implant with a short implant. But this comparison was very unfair because we don't compare different implant lengths. We compare a compromise situation where only a short implant has been possible to place versus a longer implant which have more an ideal situation. And this, out of this demand, we actually uh, initiated different study setups. On the one hand, there was one study which we compared only different lengths by having at least 10 millimeter available, where you can place a 10 millimeter or a six millimeter implant. And then you have a true comparison. And on top, and that addresses then your point, to get evidence on the level of comparing a short implant to a, um, an implant which is placed in conjunction with a sinus elevation procedure. Then you don't compare anymore just the implant length, then you compare kind of two different interventions. And this is a study which has been led by Daniel Thoma from our clinic, which we were at the end also able to come to conclusions, as you said, where we look at it from a comprehensive point of view. And that doesn't mean just the implant survival and success, that means also the cost involved, then also the time needed for doing the surgery, kind of the stress level for the surgeons doing the implants and at the end obviously also the patient reported outcomes with the uh, what the amount of painkillers the patient had to take uh, how traumatic the, the whole situation was and in all these aspects for the first time we have really been becoming evidence that it is significantly shorter the surgery it is less stressful for the surgeon that means she or he is uh, uh, is obviously doing a better job and it is less costly because there is um, less materials involved and less surgical time involved and at the end it's less invasive to the patient and that led now after a long <laughs> that led to the conclusion to say yes actually we should whenever we have the opportunity to do a short implant versus a sinus elevation procedure and about the opportunity let's now take number two the clinical norms so you master as I know, you master regeneration procedures, and you also know very well, you study a lot short implants. When is a clear no-go for short implants? And when then the grafting becomes a must mm -hmm. in, in the upper uh, situation? Mm -hmm. I would say today, there is not yet uh, studies which really compared in the limits. But today, I would say in, uh, in what we have the evidence from, but also the way I live it in clinic and how we teach it also in the University of Zurich is when we do have a height on the knees to sinus of six millimeters, then we don't go for a sinus elevation procedure anymore. Then we do go for a, a short implant in this area because I think we do have good evidence for that point of view. When it becomes kind of four millimeter or less, then uh, today we don't have the evidence to say we can just place in a four millimeter and, the, and there will be the same because that maybe that is the case, but we don't have evidence for. So I would say four millimeter or less, this is the case where today still the common understanding is and the clinical recommendations are to do an implant with a simultaneous bone augmentation procedure or when it's nothing left, so to say, where we have no chance to stabilize the implant anymore, then it's going to be a traditional two-stage procedure, having first a sinus elevation procedure and then later on a, uh, an implant placement uh, six months uh, down the road. And you apply the same principles regardless if it's a single unit or multiple situation where you have different anchor points splinting them? You're addressing a very important point and that's the question comes uh, all over. There has been always kind of uh, the idea that splinting is better than a single units. 
But what we have seen so far is that we have not found really differences there. Um, it, I think it's a little bit an, an emotional thing that we do feel like two small ones are better to be connected than one single one. But from an evidence point of view, we have not seen a difference between single uh, implants versus uh, two implants which are connected. Oh, that is actually great news because then we shift to a different topic that I have right here that I call it truth uh, or myth in the sense that in the context of short implants, uh, thinking of restoration potentially compromising the biology, there's a recurring discussion about the crown to implant mm -hmm. ratio, correct? Mm -hmm. And that comes the discussion whether to splint, not to splint, do's and don'ts. So is this inverted crown to implant ratio really an issue or myth? Mm -hmm. Now these are really very clinically relevant questions and they come all together, the short implants with the connection and then the, the crown to implant ratio. And also there we did within the University of Zurich, also in collaboration with private practices, uh, a variety of research activity, always to try to identify kind of a difference but we failed to really identify a difference also in terms of different crown to implant ratios. And this is also what, uh, what has been found then through uh, systematic approaches uh, that at the moment there is no evidence which says that kind of a long crown to a short implant, that this is a more unfavorable condition than kind of having a longer implant and a short crown. In contrast, there is one study which has been performed by Urs Belzer a couple of years ago where even the ones with the, uh, uh, with the longer crown, the shorter implants have shown less marginal bone loss than the other ones. There was just a speculation why this has happened and one potential is that the, the, the crown has a little bit more, so more forces, lateral force applied are more taken by the crown and is less pressure than on the, on the marginal bone. But this is just a speculation. But today, Conclusion is the crown to implant ratio has not an influence on biologic components. It might have on technical complication that these type of crowns have, are more likely to get maybe a, a, a screw loosening than others, but from a biological point of view that has not been considered to be a, a disadvantage. Let's go now to the third point highlighted in the beginning that comes to the ethics of care. I often hear uh, from our peers that, oh, I only offer short implants when the patient refuses to go through sinus grafting. But I question if, if you get to offer such a solution already knowing the responsibility behind. So with the understanding there will be similar results, then why is this still happening? Mm -hmm. Why is the less invasive option does not become the first choice to be provided to the patient? And if not possible, then we think of a grafting. Mm -hmm. Why do you think this happens? Is it still limited evidence? Is it continuous education that we're still not there yet providing and, and leveling uh, our peers? How do you see this happening? Because I hear quite often. Yes, I think I can answer this with one single word, <laughs> and this is trust. Trust. I think so far the dentists have not yet the trust into these short implants. And this is a multifactorial thing. It has to do that maybe some of them are not so much into the current literature. Uh, uh, some of them uh, maybe don't have access to, some of them might not have been uh, educated in, in that sense. So I think the trust is not yet on that level that people are considering these as a, as a solid alternative solution to uh, crafting and, uh, and, uh, and placing a longer implant. But I have been lecturing all over the world and I, uh, when I lecture about uh, short implants, I often ask then the audience, what would you prefer, Christian, when you would have the chance, you have uh, lost uh, uh, one or two uh, teeth in the upper, uh, upper molar area, would you prefer to undergo a lateral window approach to place the implants uh, simultaneously or would you prefer to have a short implant? And also there, I have asked this question also in, uh, in countries where I was lecturing just to oral surgeons, which make their, their living out of these type of uh, referred treatments. And none of them raised his hands to say, I want to have a lateral sinus approach uh, to place a 10 or 12 millimeter implant. All of them would also go for a more short implant. So, but I think it is still 
kind of a, an important task. We need to take this responsibility for in terms of education uh, and uh, communication, what short implants can offer. And then at the end of the day, I do believe that this becomes more an, uh, a treatment which is more often used and offered to the patient. When I look at uh, consensus papers, for example, that you just mentioned, we're not talking about a case report. We're talking about a vast amount of evidence supporting the therapy. I question, and uh, it makes me think the important role of education in this topic. Yes, right? yes. I think, you know, these consensus conferences and the outcomes, they are very, uh, they're very important. They're also very well read from all the scientific literature. But still, I think there is limited people which really do read this type of uh, information. So the vast majority of the people, they uh, go to courses, to congresses, and, and I think there it's our responsibility to just give perspective. It doesn't mean to tell them you need to place short implants, mm -hmm. but what they need to do is they need to offer these options to the patient, and at the end the patient needs to be able to choose, to say, no, I really, I, I, uh, I see the point uh, uh, and I would like to go more in this direction or that direction, but it's important to really offer the option to the patient. I agree completely. And you touch a very important topic that is trust. And if we have to tell a clinician and we have this session on open mic that is sell me this pen, give me three reasons why a clinician should right now start considering short implants as the rule of daily basis practice instead of more invasive alternatives. Number one, it does make an impact for the patient comfort. Uh, and this is at the end what builds their business on because uh, they, the more happy patient they have, the more patient will talk about uh, their office to say, listen, this is an amazing office. They offer me a modern uh, solution which uh, uh, doesn't let me uh, stay home for uh, 10 days after the, the intervention. That's number one, to really find the best possible situation for the patient. Number two, it does reduce also the, uh, my own invasiveness and my own stress level because the more confident I feel doing this, the better the outcome will be. And we do know the more stressed I am, the more invasive things are, the, the more stressful the overall treatment will be. And number three is then at the end of the day that it makes my office also more efficient. Uh, which at the end is also a uh, uh, part of, of consider which needs to be considered because I can, I can start with the next patient earlier than uh, doing a, a grafting procedure. I'm sold. Thank you and I agree with you completely. And it's this, uh, honestly, this relentless commitment from the industry to develop better technologies and the relentless commitment from outstanding professionals like yourself, always searching and researching alternatives to better serve the patients, that makes implantology an incredible, an incredible field to be working in. So thank you very much. It was a very insightful conversation. Thank you very much once again for stopping by at Strom and Open Mic, Professor. Thank you very much, Christian. You always are an excellent moderator yeah. and, uh, and colleague, and uh, I do appreciate having been able to, to be part of that important session. Thank you very much. Well, I'm honored to have you here. And I thank you all for your kind attention, and we see each other in the next episode of Straubman Open Mic. Thank you. Ciao.